Hello, I'm Diane Grobe Schmidt, immediate past president of the American Chemical Society and chair of the Committee on Corporation Associates. It is my pleasure to introduce today's Network and Learn event on innovation and commercialization. This event is brought to you as part of the ACS Chemical Business Network program designed to create opportunities for industry scientists to network and learn. My priority is to support our members working in the business of chemistry. As a former senior scientist and section head with the Procter & Gamble Company, I know well the contributions that chemists and industry make to our lives. And as an 11-year veteran of the ACS Board of Directors, I want you to know how much ACS values you. We recognize the need of industry members to gain information specific to their jobs, to participate in more professional development and training, and to have more opportunities to network and share best practices on innovation and commercialization. Today's Network and Learn event was designed to do just that. Use this opportunity to take advantage of everything that ACS can offer to help you and your business. Network with your fellow scientists and share your best ideas in the chemical industries. Thank you everyone for being part of ACS and enjoy the show. Welcome to ACS Network and Learn, which is being brought to you by ACS Industry Member Programs, Immediate Past President Diane Grobe Schmidt, with financial support provided by Procter & Gamble. This event features Michael Blaustein, who will be speaking about the role that collaboration plays in making innovation successful. Michael is the principal at the MAB Innovation Group, where he collaborates with early stage companies in the greater Philadelphia region. After Michael's presentation, a pre-recorded Q&A session will be moderated by Tom Connolly, the Executive Director and CEO of the American Chemical Society. Hello, I'm Tom Connolly, the Executive Director of ACS, and it's a real pleasure to welcome you, our large audience, to today's Network and Learn webinar on innovation. Innovation is very important to me personally, having spent most of my career participating in innovation and leading innovation teams. Now more than ever, scientists and engineers must be vocal and visible in their support for research and innovation. Basic science underpins all innovation, and I know we have a global audience today, but in the U.S. as a country, we need to continue to invest in fundamental R&D. As we focus on rebuilding America's physical infrastructure, Let's renew our R&D infrastructure as well. And it is also important that we connect innovation to our R&D efforts. It's been said that research converts money into knowledge and that innovation converts knowledge into money. You cannot get the latter without investing in the former. ACS will be working with other scientific societies and making this message clearly to the new administration. And now let's move to today's program. I am very pleased to introduce our featured presenter, my former colleague, Dr. Michael Blaustein. Michael is a consultant and collaborator with early stage companies and the entrepreneurial ecosystem in the Mid-Atlantic region. He focuses on business development, innovation strategy, corporate collaborations, and venture capital investing. Michael began his career at the DuPont Company in research and development. He held technology, marketing, and business leadership positions in DuPont Nonwovens and DuPont Advanced Fiber Systems while based in the U.S. and Europe. Later, he joined DuPont Central Research and Development, where he became director of DuPont Ventures and strategic planning director for science and technology. He holds a BA degree in chemistry from Columbia University and a PhD in chemistry from Yale University. And now it's my pleasure to turn the floor over to Michael. Well, thank you, Tom, for your kind introduction. The theme for today is that successful innovation is by its very nature a collaborative business endeavor. And I suspect that some of what I touch on today is already part of the audience's business approach to innovation. But I'll also hope that I'll give some new ideas about the role of collaboration in your innovation networks. I'm going to start by discussing some of the essentials for successful innovation, which will make the case that collaboration is key. 
I'll then illustrate several types of collaborations in what I'll call the product and market dimensions. And then before we get to questions and answers, I'll touch on some of the issues that need to be managed in collaborative arrangements. So I'm going to start here with some definitions that I think make clear the difference between inventing and innovating and point us towards really the essential collaborative nature of business innovation. So dictionary.com tells us that inventing is the creation of something new through one's own ingenuity. This is not to say that people working together don't also invent, but it does suggest that inventing can come from an individual's spark of inspiration. And indeed, we associate many iconic inventions, such as the light bulb and the telephone, with famous inventors like Edison and Bell. In contrast, the definition of innovate starts with a transaction, the introduction of something new. There must be at least two parties involved, a sender and a receiver. And to me, this is the foundation of collaboration. What are some of the hallmarks of successful, or the essentials of successful innovation? Here I'm borrowing a framework developed by our host Tom Connolly, which he and I used together while working on DuPont's R&D portfolio. And I want to start here in the middle. For those of us in industry, successful innovation means making money. And innovation is about growing our companies and providing a return to our owners, as Tom said during the introduction. It's really, really that simple. What I'm showing here are three essential elements for innovations that deliver those returns. At the top is uniqueness. And uniqueness can be in the form of patents and know-how, things that come directly from invention. It can also come through business models, ways of serving customers and creating value that are difficult or impossible to duplicate. I think business models can sometimes be difficult to protect from imitation, however. You know, you can look to Uber as an example of a company which created a unique business model but was really quickly emulated. But the essence of uniqueness is that your company can offer something that no one or a few others can offer, at least for a period of time. So you have an invention. You've got some uniqueness. The question is, who cares? And that's what market relevance is all about. Does the invention solve a real problem? Is it a high priority problem that motivates customers to spend their money to acquire your solution? In other words, is it a problem worth solving? And without market relevance, there's really little chance that an invention will generate a return for your company. Third, we get to route to market. It's essential that your customer has a means of getting your unique, valuable, and relevant solution to customers. If it's a product, of course, this could mean can it be manufactured? Do you know who the customers are and can you get to them? Can you put the supply chain together, both upstream and downstream, that enables the production and delivery of your solution? Let's go back now to collaboration. As I already noted, many aspects of uniqueness can be accomplished on one's own or in your own company. Inventing, patenting, and keeping know-how, these can be done in-house. While it's true that uniqueness can be created in isolation or in-house, it does not have to be. And shortly we'll take a look at some types of collaborations where inventing is part of the collaborative process. In contrast, I contend that it's really impossible to achieve market relevance and establish a route to market without collaboration. Market relevance can only be understood by being in the market with your customers and your customers' customers and by understanding your competitors. Understanding and establishing market relevance is a broad organizational responsibility. It really needs to be shared functionally by marketing and sales, business planning, and of course by R&D. The essence of market relevance is ensuring that your innovation portfolio is addressing important high-value problems, and this is clearly a broad business responsibility. Route to market is all about delivering a new product or service. Of course, your production or manufacturing may happen inside the fence, or not, but the total process happens in concert with suppliers and customers. So sometimes this is transactional in nature, buying and selling materials and intermediates, but the power really comes when it becomes a collaborative process, when suppliers and customers collaborate on product specifications that optimize both companies' products and performance is a simple example. I think it's important to develop a strategy for route to market early in your innovation process, and it yields many benefits if you do. You'll find ways to enhance uniqueness and market relevance by thinking about this route to market. You will identify and address potential gaps in your go-to-market capability 
And doing so early will avoid delays in your market introduction and your business ramp up. And finally, you'll be sensitive to changes in the market structure, customer demands, and so forth that need to be dialed into your innovation agenda in real time. Mike, I think we've got a quick poll. And here is our first poll. We'll give you a few moments to select the right answer. Well, Michael, is that about what you were thinking? I guess, Mike, I'm not surprised to hear that result. And I actually hope to make the case that our colleagues in R&D should enlist additional engagement from their colleagues in other functions. In this part of the discussion, I'd like to start exploring collaborations in two dimensions, one of which I'll call the market capability and the other product capability. And starting with what we're looking for on the market side, there are three important areas where collaborations can help. One is on insight. What's going on in the market? What trends should be considered in technology, demographics, social, and so on? Another area for collaboration is opportunity. From these insights, what business opportunities are open to your company? What market relevant problems are out there as viewed through your company's strategic filters? And finally, a third area for collaboration we'll touch on is customer as partner. How can we work with customers in the broadest sense as partners to increase our market capability through increasing our insight and our understanding of opportunities? On the product side, we're going to explore three types of collaborations. One is really outsourcing for a needed capability in product development or manufacturing, outsourcing. Second. I'd like to touch on collaborating with academia and government resources. And third, we'll talk about one of my favorites, corporate venture capital investing. Before we move on to those, I want to make a really important point. I think that market and product knowledge capability should be advanced in tandem. This is important. You do not want your product capability getting ahead of your understanding of the market. In other words, understanding of market relevance and your route to market. Doing so sets you up for what I think is one of the most distressing type of innovation portfolio failures, a technical or R&D success that turns out to be a commercial flop because you weren't market relevant or you couldn't meet customer needs. It's really a distressing way to spend your R&D budget on successful research and end up with a commercial failure. On the other hand, if you can advance these dimensions in tandem, you'll find that your product design is influenced by market insights and your progress on product will help you understand even better what opportunities you've got and the partnerships you need to succeed commercially. So again, advancing these in tandem is, I think, an important business responsibility. I'd like to start with market insight and opportunity. And again, the goal here is to ensure market relevance, that the problem you're working on is real and solving it is worthwhile. First important point is you can't fake this and win, in my opinion. Exploring markets requires expertise, you know, depth and breadth. It requires data and it requires market research. We've all seen too many examples where one data point, one customer request, one idea formed the basis for an R&D project. It's simply not sufficient. The next point I want to make is around the voice of the customer. We've all heard the phrase, voice of the customer. And for those of you in R&D at your companies, this is not the same as voice of marketing or voice of sales. Now, this is not to say that marketing and sales colleagues are uninformed or don't have a valid perspective on market relevance. But I am saying that scientists and engineers see the world through different lenses than our colleagues in marketing. We ask different questions. And I think it's your responsibility in R&D to get out into the world and engage market relevance hands-on. So here's a quote I love from a Steve Blank, who's a serial entrepreneur and a guru for startup companies and how to help them succeed. Most recently in a YouTube video that was targeted at startups, but it applies to established companies as well. And what he said is, there are no facts inside your building. And the point he's trying to make here is, you need to get outside of your company in order to gain market insight. And that means collaborating with customers, thought leaders, market researchers, whomever it takes. And I, again, I want to emphasize this is a role for R&D along with our business sales, marketing, and planning colleagues to make this happen. 
On this slide, I just want to offer in brief a concept I learned from Pam Henderson, who is a strategy, market research, and innovation consultant I had the opportunity to work with during my time at DuPont. One of her notions is that an idea is not the same thing as an opportunity. Opportunities exist in the world whether or not we have ideas now to address them. And they don't go away. Opportunities don't go away if the specific idea we tried to address an opportunity isn't successful. I highly recommend you explore this, this concept of opportunity thinking as a way to focus your innovation efforts on real world challenges and to build your conviction around these challenges as focal points for your innovation effort, frankly, that focal points that could outlast an individual program or idea that you might have started to address an opportunity. So we'll touch briefly now on customers as partners, and they can be engaged across the entire process, from ideation to creation of solutions and to commercialization. Here I just wanted to highlight what two large companies, DuPont and 3M, are doing to capture insights and inspirations of customers. DuPont established 12 innovation centers around the world, and I had the privilege to work with a number of them during my time at the company. A few are located at laboratory sites, but most are located remotely, close to where customers are. And the idea of them is to bring DuPont science to the customers, in person or through video links, in order to understand opportunities and to collaborate on potential solutions. And here's what DuPont says about its innovation centers. It's a place where new ideas become a reality. We believe that together we can accomplish what no person, company, or organization can address alone. Again, the focus is on collaboration. 3M has designed its innovation centers to be an immersive experience in science for customers, as reported here by the New York Times. The idea is to stimulate the imaginations of visitors about how to use 3M products and to help 3M researchers understand the next opportunities to solve. So in the New York Times article, they emphasized Imagine, hands-on exhibits, a showroom that's the cornerstone of 3M's customer innovation center at its headquarters. So I think these are two examples of customer engagement through innovation centers. You might want to explore these on the internet, or hopefully, better yet, arrange a visit to one with these companies or others. Now I'm going to switch to collaboration in the product dimension. I've chosen to illustrate outsourcing as one approach with one of my first research projects at DuPont. The challenge my team and I faced was to create a fire blocking layer for commercial aircraft seats. The fire blocker layer structure is illustrated here. The layer was to go between the seat foam, which was back in those days flammable, and the cover fabric, the dress fabric that the upholstery is covered. And the purpose of this fire blocker was to prevent the foam from igniting in the case of a cabin fire, which created time for passengers to escape. There was an FAA regulation in place and a testing protocol that all aircraft seats had to meet. So the solution we developed was this quilted fabric shown at the top left. And the way we did it is we worked with a commercial quilter to develop and manufacture the structure. So a commercial quilter with a lot of experience in these multi-layer structures was really an important part of our development process. We also outsourced our product qualification testing, which is shown here. The challenge in this test here was to achieve less than 10% weight loss after a two-minute exposure of a mock-up seat to an oil burner, which meant that the fire blocker had to keep the seat foam from igniting. Now, it may seem obvious to you today that some aspects of product development should be outsourced to increase a firm's overall capability, but I have to say that when I started in DuPont in 1982, it was definitely not our first instinct. In fact, I worked at DuPont's textile research laboratory, which was really a temple of internal innovation. DuPont had created under one roof the capability to do just about every textile manufacturing step from yarn spinning to garment sewing. And it was done for a good reason. It enabled the textile industry to adapt natural fiber processing techniques to the synthetic fibers that DuPont was introducing to the world. DuPont was tremendously successful in growing its synthetic fiber business. However, what we didn't have at the textile research laboratory were the things we needed to be successful in fire blocking layers. And by going outside of DuPont for key parts of our development, we tapped into resources that were fast, flexible, and expert. We worked directly with seat manufacturers in their testing facilities. So while we were doing our R&D, we were positioning our product for sale and we were still able to patent our technology as shown here. 
by carefully managing the exposure of confidential information outside the company during the process. So I should point out outsourcing is common today in industries from pharmaceuticals to electronics. And I like to think of it as a really a foundational approach to collaborative innovation. Next up, we're going to talk a bit about academic and government collaborations. But first, we have a quick survey. Time for our second poll. Which response do you think is right? Well, here we have Mike. Government universities are definitely significant performers of, of R&D in the U.S. And there are two ways of looking at their involvement. And the right side is the performance. So universities and colleges are responsible for performing 14% of the R&D as measured by spending. The federal government, through the national labs and other resources, is responsible for about 11% of the spending. But businesses still are responsible for the bulk of the spending at a bit over 70%. I also wanted to highlight here the funding source. Businesses are responsible for a bulk of the funding, but federal government is quite a large share at about 27%. This is 2013 data which was released by the National Science Board of the NSF in 2016. Industry has an important role in transforming this basic research that's done in government and university labs into products that can capitalize on these investments. Tom referred to this early on in the introduction. How is this accomplished? I just want to touch on a few ways. Universities and national labs in general have technology transfer offices whose role it is to make patented technologies available for licensing to industry. To me, this is essentially a matchmaking process. And so one of the challenges here is that companies need to know where to look. Key here is good competitive intelligence and the awareness that you develop by monitoring trends, looking at technology opportunities that crop up through your networking to get the insights about where to look for these emerging technologies. Another interesting area which I think is companies a more proactive role is through consortia of government, academia, and industry. These are a great way for industry to get early visibility into emerging technologies. And an example here is the Battery 500 Consortium, which is aimed at sparking innovations for electric vehicles, brought together under the leadership of the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, the stakeholders, aimed at really meeting the needs of automotive and battery manufacturers for electric vehicles. Another approach is for universities and companies to collaborate around specific research projects. Here an example, which was reported by both DuPont and Johns Hopkins University, is a collaboration to produce an improved Ebola protection suit. These kinds of project-specific collaborations sometimes can be enabled by research grants, sponsored research grants, where the company funds an academic research program and secures the right to commercial use of the outcome. Any discussion of industry partnering with academia would be incomplete if we didn't mention the pharma industry. And I sort of ripped from the CNE News headlines some illustrations there. Large pharma companies have replaced much of their internal discovery research with early stage research done at universities and advanced towards commercialization through startup companies. These collaborations run the gamut of basic research and discovery to biotech manufacturing, including one report that GlaxoSmithKline and the University of North Carolina established a research center and a special purpose company to house intellectual property. I've included links to these articles. They're really very interesting at the end of the presentation if you'd like to learn more about them. So we're going to turn now to the third collaboration type that I want to discuss today, and that's corporate venture capital. And I have to admit to some bias here. I have the privilege of leading DuPont Ventures, DuPont's corporate venture capital program, for about 10 years. And I'm really a strong believer in the power of established companies and startups collaborating on new technologies and corporate venture capital is a way to make this happen. Here's what it is and how it works. At its core, it's companies acting like venture capitalists by investing in startups. It's typically done with strategic goals in mind, such as gaining visibility to emerging technologies, perhaps creating options for future acquisitions, invest in the company, own a little bit, monitor how it's doing, and potentially acquire the company. You see this a lot in the pharma industry right now. And also, in the early phase of the investment, there's the potential to collaborate through joint developments for the development and introduction of products and 
processes. Corporate venture capitalists typically invest along with traditional venture capitalists. So from the startup's point of view, they are part of their overall financing plan as well as partners in innovation. There are a number of ways that corporate VCs operate. It includes investing directly in companies, as I've already mentioned. Corporate VCs also invest in venture capital funds, which in turn are investing in companies in a sector of interest to them. For an example, an agricultural technology company might invest in a venture capital fund targeting agricultural biotechnology to observe and participate and engage with companies in the emerging field of ag biotech, new technology in ag biotech. And when corporate venture capitals invest, they typically want a blend of equity-related rights, such as board seats, and strategic rights, such as the opportunity to work with the startup company in a specific domain, on a specific project, or in a market segment, and to establish a preferential ability to be the route to market for the results of that effort. Here's a little bit more about corporate venture capital. It's really booming in the United States and globally because CVCs have proven to be great partners for startups and are an important route to liquidity for investors. One of the main routes for liquidity for small companies traditionally was IPOs, initial public offerings, but those are harder to achieve these days and many more startup companies are exiting through acquisitions by larger companies and that's how our investors get the return. A couple of data points about corporate venture capital. In the past six years or so, they've raised or identified commitments of over $30 billion of capital globally. And as a fraction of total venture capital funding, corporate venture capital represents about 20% with an investment that's in the range of about $20 billion a year. Now I have to say that the data here is a bit murky because many corporate venture capital groups don't disclose their investments. And so there's some extrapolating going on here by these sources that I cite on the page. And there are a lot of corporate venture capital groups. 1,600 have been identified. Now they're participating in about 250 deals per year, so you can see that the activity is somewhat concentrated. Just want to show you for a moment where the money's going. Top chart shows the investment by sector and chemistry related enterprise, which I would say include healthcare, computers, parts of telecom, and the other sector here, the green sector, represent about half of the investment. So I think there are a lot of opportunities for companies in the chemical enterprises through corporate venture capital. Also, I'd like to call your attention to the investment by stage of company or the stage of investment, starting with the earliest stages, seed and angel, series A and series B, all relatively early stages. You can see that nearly three quarters of the investment is in those stages. And that makes sense for corporate venture capitalists because it's in these early stages that there are the best opportunities for collaboration. So message here is if you want to operate in corporate venture capital space, get involved with companies early on. Here's an example from my time in DuPont. This was an investment announced in 2015 in the booming area of CRISPR-Cas enabled gene editing. This investment was by DuPont in Caribou Biosciences. And the way it was described as a strategic alliance where DuPont and Caribou cross-licensed intellectual property. DuPont and Caribou entered into a multi-year research collaboration and DuPont made an equity investment. So these are all the key ingredients for corporate strategic investment in a company. Here's what DuPont and Caribou had to say about this. Rachel Horowitz, president and CEO of Caribou, said that she was thrilled to partner with DuPont on this initiative and to work collaboratively with the company to speed our product development. And I think that's the big plus for the startups. Collaboration with a company like DuPont can often speed the evolution of their company. DuPont's Jim Burrell, said that Caribou is at the forefront of the CRISPR-Cas technology and we're pleased to be collaborating with them to advance this important breakthrough in biology. So in my view, this investment is a great example of the win-win we strive for in corporate venture capital investing. Before we wrap up, I want to acknowledge that there are some challenges we face in collaborative innovation. The first one is sharing the spoils. 
collaborators will want to share in the outcomes, will want to share in the upside. I think it's important to enter collaborations with a structure where you've thought about how these spoils will be shared, to ensure a win-win for you and your partners, and anticipate this mechanism, design it up front. Intellectual property is often viewed as a challenge area. How can I have patents if I'm going to be working with partners? Will I lose my secrets? And clearly this needs to be managed, and I think there are relatively straightforward ways. Working under joint development agreements can ensure confidentiality, can address the issue of intellectual property ownership. With academia, employing sponsored research agreements where there's an opportunity for intellectual property rights are methods for dealing with this issue. The next two challenge areas are really more about people and culture. The NIH syndrome, not invented here syndrome, is resistance to ideas and technology from outside your company. We all know about that. I think an important step here is to reward and recognize collaborations in your company. Those that work out and those that those good tries that didn't succeed. And then I think there can be a preference among scientists for discovery and inventing as opposed to collaborating. So what do you do here? I always thought about redefining the role of a corporate scientist from inventing to inventing and integrating, integrating external knowledge and science into their work. And of course, reward that, reward that collaboration and integration. Finally, I'd like to recommend to everyone the work of Henry Chesbro, what he coined open innovation and later on also open business models. These are excellent books that address the theory and practice behind many of the collaborative innovation approaches we discussed today. So Mike, I think we have one more survey question. Which is the correct answer for our third poll? Research and development was 83, marketing and sales was 68%, operations and manufacturing was 54, and corporate development executive leadership was 75. Well, I'm really pleased to see that. I think it's much more balanced than we saw at the beginning, and I think it does capture the spirit of collaboration really in two dimensions and viewing innovation as an enterprise endeavor. In summary, innovation is a collaborative process. It's an enterprise initiative and not just an R&D responsibility. And I hope that you're already reaching outside your company for insight, opportunities, and solutions. If you're not, perhaps you're inspired to do so. Before turning it over to Q&A, I'd like to call your attention to some resources and references I pulled together at the end. They're available to you in the slides. I thank you for your attention, and I'll uh, turn it back to Mike. We are not done yet, and so I'm going to throw it over to Tom to take your first question. Mike, thanks very much, and we have a very healthy queue of questions that our audience has submitted, so we'll get to as many as we can, and I'll try to bundle a few questions together to speed things along. Quite a number of questions came in regarding academic research. Michael, what are your thoughts on the following? How can someone in an academic lab attract the attention of industry? Another question is, should academic researchers be concerned about the market relevance of their work, or is their role different? And finally, are there any best practices in how to structure university industry collaboration? Those are really interesting questions, Tom. Taking the first two parts, attention and relevance, so I'm of the opinion that, first of all, not all academic researchers need to be concerned about market relevance. I think there's an important place for fundamental science. I think it's a choice. I think if a researcher or a research team want to see their technology moving into the, in the commercial direction, they do need to attract attention. I think using vehicles such as getting part of consortia, maybe showing up at places where companies show up, meetings and events where you can meet companies can be relevant. I think a lot of academic people capture the attention of industry by starting up companies, having intellectual property in their tech transfer offices, but actually trying to form a company around it. In fact, some of the work I'm doing now post-DuPont is with universities in the Philadelphia area where there are researchers who have an idea, have a patent, and are trying to form a business around that patent. So those are a few suggestions. Okay, thanks very much. We had a couple questions around innovation and the role of the scientists within innovation. 
Maybe I'll start with an observation. Were you surprised by the fact that in the first survey question, the audience seemed to feel that innovation was an R&D focused activity and maybe a related question is well if it's all about knowledge then that knowledge exists in the R&D organization so why isn't an innovation organization stacked with PhD scientists and engineers? Right so Tom on the first point I wasn't surprised to see that answer and frankly it's something that I think we battled at DuPont the sort of the delegation of bringing new things to market to the R&D organization. And I frankly think that it's not the most effective way, and I was glad to hear at the end that it was seen as more of a business enterprise. And I think the reason it's not the most effective is that we do need to advance our innovation in those two dimensions, the product dimension and the market dimension. And I think both R&D, business, R&D, marketing, sales, and our operations people need to work together to really accomplish that advancement in tandem. So I was not surprised at the beginning, and I was pleased at the end in the, when we saw the second survey. Very good. Another question is really driven at the idea that, Michael, most of your examples, we refer to your DuPont experience, you use 3M as an example. Can you say a few words about what's different for, or are there differences for innovation in a smaller chemistry enterprise? Yeah. So I've had the opportunity to do some work in smaller companies even just this past year. Of course, one of the challenges faced is smaller organizations, smaller resources. So really, the choices and focus need to be sharper. But I think some of the principles around collaboration are available to smaller enterprises as well as larger. And I think maybe another way to think about it is to turn the question on its head. And maybe a smaller enterprise should view itself as the organization a larger enterprise might collaborate with. But I think that with proper focus, a number of the principles ought to be leverageable in smaller enterprises as well. Okay. And certainly your thoughts about uniqueness and market relevance and commercialization pathways would be the same irrespective of the size of the organization, presumably. I think that's right. You know, maybe it's even more critical to some extent in a smaller organization. A large organization, there may be some ability to deal with error. I'm not saying it's a good thing, but there's more resilience in a large organization. Certainly in a startup company, being on the wrong path of market relevance or route to market for very long you know, will ultimately put the company out of business, so it will be necessary to pivot. So I think perhaps those elements are even more critical in a smaller enterprise. Very good. You made reference to Professor Chesborough's work on open innovation. One trend that has sort of developed, maybe subsequent to the publishing of his book, is the idea and prominence of crowdsourcing. Companies, even within the chemistry enterprise, are making use of crowdsourcing techniques. And I, I would like to pair that question with another one around collaboration and intellectual property. How do we assure that people who are contributing and bringing value to the innovation are rewarded with IP. Do you have any thoughts either about crowdsourcing or the appropriate use of IP and division of IP, if you will, in terms of collaboration? So I think on the subject of IP, I think it's appropriate that collaborators who develop IP will want to share in the benefit of that. And I've seen many examples where we've been able to work that out in my experience at DuPont Ventures and work on technology transfer with universities. I've seen many examples where appropriate arrangements on sharing the benefits of IP, which you know doesn't necessarily mean ownership. It can mean licensing and cross-licensing. The Caribou DuPont investment is an example where cross-licensing played an important, important role. You know, on crowdsourcing for chemical enterprises, I have to admit I haven't given that much thought you know, I don't think that traditional investors are yet looking at crowdsourcing as a significant competitor in terms of driving innovation. Traditional investors like venture capitalists or corporate VCs aren't looking at crowdsourcing as a competitor for the things we're going after. That's not to say that crowdsourcing couldn't be a vehicle but I haven't thought of it in the context of what we're typically trying to go after as companies. 
Good. We're running a bit short on time at this point, Michael, so maybe I'll ask a final pair of questions. You were passionate in your support for corporate venture capital, and maybe two questions around CVC, and that is, is the time horizon, is the patience of a CVC different from that of a traditional venture capitalist? And the second part of it is, what about non-U.S. companies? Is the trend towards CVC alive and well in other markets, or is that more of a U.S. phenomenon? Yes. On the patients, corporate venture capitalists are probably more patient in many respects than a financial venture capitalist, for whom really the exit can't come too soon. A corporate venture capitalist who's investing and collaborating with a company, I believe, is happy with that arrangement while the collaboration is progressing. And if the time for the company to exit through an IPO or through an acquisition is extended, that's not really a negative issue for a corporate venture capitalist. And what about outside the U.S.? Uh, outside the U.S., yes. Corporate venture capital is active outside the U.S. DuPont, during my time leading ventures, made a number of investments in companies outside the U.S., and I think it is definitely becoming a global phenomenon. I don't have the data in front of me, but both in terms of the companies doing the investing and the companies that are being investing in, there's a clear global trend around corporate venture capital. Right, and, and certainly BSF has been very active even in acquiring startups in the U.S. I think it is a trend that's progressing worldwide. Michael, we're running short on time, but my words of thanks to you for your presentation, and I also want to give you the last word here. Do you have one more point that you'd like to share with our listeners today? Well, uh, really a simple one, Tom. Some of my best times at DuPont was when I was working actively in innovation, working with universities or companies we were investing in and on product development. So in addition to its being you know, so critical to growing a company, I think it's just a stimulating kind of work. I highly commend it to everyone as something to consider and really make it part of your career. Good. On, on that note, Mike, maybe I'll turn the floor back over to you for the wrap-up. All right. Thank you so much, both you and Tom and Michael, for sharing your time and knowledge with us today. Thank you so much for viewing this Network & Learn event, which has been supported by Diane Grobe-Schmidt, the ACS Immediate Past President, and Procter & Gamble. The American Chemical Society is committed to supporting industry, industrial chemists, and chemical engineers. ACS offers companies the opportunity to join Corporation Associates, which is the formal link between ACS and the chemical and allied industries. The Society also hosts a CTO Summit, an Entrepreneurial Summit, and the annual Pharma Leaders Conference. ACS provides recognition of industry scientists through awards programs, including the Heroes of Chemistry program. ACS industry members also benefit from the ACS's public policy advocacy efforts, its chemical abstract service offerings, and its Green Chemistry Institute. Companies also have the opportunity to support and recruit from the ACS Scholars Program, which awards renewable scholarships to underrepresented minority students who want to enter the fields of chemistry or chemistry-related fields. In addition, ACS members gain access to career and professional development tools, networking opportunities, and industry-focused short courses and webinars. For more information about what ACS industry member programs can do for you, go to www.acs.org/industry or email us at industry@acs.org. At